great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected, only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least, that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASEC certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hey. Here we are. It's tent time. We are recording our very first full conversational episode between the two of us from our very strange tent-based life it's right now. It's a great now. tent. Oh, it's a great tent. And it's it's a really also good tent. where our bed is now. So. Yeah. So funnily enough, we've been recording these all along from our bed and we switched over to my new tiny little office. Um, and I didn't actually think that the sound quality was as good so even though we have wind and such to contend with here, we get to be outside. We're outside and there's yeah, there's a lot, little more ambient noise, but it's nice here. And, and most importantly for me, I wanted to have this conversation, this particular conversation in a place where you might feel calm and relaxed. Well, this is a, um, it's not tricky, it's not sticky, it's just a, a conversation that um, involves a lot of the things that I struggle with in my own personal self. And I think, you know, we talk on this podcast about a lot of stuff that each of us struggles with, but I've noticed that this topic, even this word, accountability, we're going to talk about accountability and reliability. And the word accountability has come up as like a, I almost want to put it in the category of a trigger word for you. For me, yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I think trigger's too strong a word from how it's usually used, but when I hear it, I am immediately reminded of, um, well, the the list of things that I haven't been accountable for, (laughs) and um, yeah, my, my struggle, so I'm immediately, it does shift me into thinking about those things. Okay, so I, I think the first time you and I discussed accountability it was as business partners yeah i think you're right okay yeah. so we owned a business together that we started with another person with a person you were married to at the time mm-hmm. and when we started that business um i was at a financial disadvantage in the arrangement um because the money i had was tied up in a house and i couldn't access it um I couldn't access a lot. I I didn't have any fluidity in my life and I didn't have stability in my life. I didn't have a place to live that was at that time actually owned by me. And so that left me in a weird spot. So 
we started talking and account about accountability at a time when we were very, we were both vulnerable. I was vulnerable yeah. in a sort of nah, more classically understandable way. I was vulnerable in that I was fault. I was financially at risk. Um, my, I was, uh, my home security, yeah, my home householding security, security was at risk. Was at risk mm -hmm. Right. So that's one thing. And I think most people understand that, but you were also vulnerable because we had, um, broken out of a bunch of the boxes that used to contain our relationships. And when we, when we started writing new rules, new, and I mean rules, like rules to the game, yeah. <laughs> we started, um, not rules for our relationship, but when we started tossing aside the conventions that we had used to make the, the boundaries, like the, the conventions there, the conventions. Yep. I remember looking at you frequently and seeing you with this, this look on your face that I interpreted at the time as, um, frustration. And I think back now on that, and um, I'm not sure it was frustration. I think you were, you looked scared, but I didn't yet know what scared looks like. Yeah, that, that sounds right. And also from your position of being in, you know, financial and yeah, sort of physical risk. What would I have had to be scared about? Because I didn't have any of those things. So I right. can see where it, it wouldn't have occurred to you that that yeah. might be how I felt. I felt like you had an incredibly st stable life. And let's get clear. Accountable. I, I actually looked up a definition because I wanted to make sure I was choosing the right word to talk about this. Um, accountability is, is, of course, from the word accountable. And accountable means a, a couple different things. It means understandable and explicit um, explicable to be able to explain it. Right. But it also means, um, that there's expectations that you can justify the actions behind your choices and decisions. And that's, I think what we're really talking about. Okay. That, like, can you explain from my, my, my researcher self, every time I make a decision in my research, I have to be able to explain my rationale. I don't have to make a, a there's not just one decision I can make, like in how I select participants or how I, choose my research question, but I do need to be able to explain what my rationale was, which helps other people understand whether that rationale makes sense in through their own lens, right? So we look at accountable and say... And say, I think it's do your decisions, like, do that? <laughs> I think it's interesting. So I've, I've been thinking of accountability as, have I done what I said I was going to do? But what you just described is... <laughs> does what I have done make sense? Well, that's kind you know of how I hear it. I think that's I Which, think that's actually the issue. I like it. We have talked about accountability in a very practical day to day sense as being, have I done what I said I was going to do? But I think that lacks some nuance. It does. I think I, that I, when we're yeah. talking about accountability in relationships, what we're really wanting is to have our partner understand our decision making process because life is dynamic. Life isn't always going to mean I have done X, Y, Z because I said I was going to do X, Y, Z. I mean, I'm a huge fan of following up and doing what you said you were going to do. But life is also about living in the moment and responding to the dynamic reality that there is. We have seven kids yeah. and a business. Um, I, own a, I own a company and you have a full-time job. And all of that means that our our relationship and all the other relationships we have um yeah sometimes we don't do what we said we were going to do because if we did it would mess everything up right I, and that is actually messing with my head right now in it, this moment because is. i, I like the idea that if i just do what i said i was going to do everything will work out but here's what I just heard, and it is. It, I, I feel like this is the first time I've had these thoughts. Okay, so I said I was going to do something, and you're counting on me doing that thing. And then it turns out that I'm not going to do it because, I mean, situation changed. Yeah. Well, obviously that yeah. happens, and you have to make a different choice. Mm -hmm. So now the issue is whether I can share with you the fact that I'm not going to do it in a way that you're going to understand. Right, and, and when. Or at least that I can share my understanding of what's going to happen and when. And when. And, and yeah. so there's a, there are a bunch of fine lines here. 
Um, when am I sharing that there's a change in the plan? How am I sharing it? Um, it who actually is responsible for making this decision? Because if we're going to have autonomy, then right. getting to change the plans is part of it. In fact, we can't actually have consent, right, without it being ongoing and reversible. So I actually don't think we can separate out consent and the fact that it has to be ongoing and reversible from being accountable. And this means that we're in a pickle when it comes to accountability. It is not the simple thing that I, even I have hoped it would be. Um, this isn't the first time I've talked about it. This isn't the first time I've written about it. But I feel like even just right now, the glass is breaking. And I'm just hearing it shatter like, oh, yeah. Conversations about accountability have to be complicated. Because because life is life complicated, is complicated yeah, of course. Right. And a, a strict adherence to some sort of um, uh, baseline accountability being you will do what you said you were going to do and that's the end of it. Well, it, it robs us of the ability to respond to the situation, both internal and external. And it makes me think about when, um, when I first fell in love with you, I was very um, naive, I've said before, and I shared that with everyone involved. I shared it with you. I shared it with um, the person I was married to, the person you were married to, our mutual friends. And people handled that information in very different ways. And this isn't really about how everybody responded. But my husband at the time, um, he responded in a bunch of different ways because parts of him seemed to be actually in alignment. We're like, oh, okay, you've fallen in love with other people before. I think we can figure this out. But as time went on and it became more and more apparent that we couldn't figure it out. Or more importantly, that he wasn't interested in figuring out a polyamorous situation. Fair enough. The thing that he said to me was that I'd made a promise and I needed to keep it. I'd made a promise and I needed to keep it. I had made oh, a vow. I remember us having lots of and, conversations about that. And I was stuck because the thing he wanted me to stop was he wanted me to stop a particular feeling. I was still in dialogue with him about what the feeling needed to be, like how I, how I acted. In other words, I was having... Um, passionate feelings about you. I was having feelings about you that involved the words love, that involved the idea of erotic energy, um, the, 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 ex the expression of that through really at that point, just dancing, um, and holding hands. There was nothing really major going on. Yeah. We kissed maybe once. Uh, yeah. Um, and at a time when other people were kissing each other, so it wasn't particularly out of the realm of normal right then. Um, but when I was experiencing this um, glass shattering moment of, oh, I, I've met this, I've met, I've met this person. I've seen this person. I want to have a relationship with them. Uh Oh, I'm already married. When he said that he, I had made a promise and I needed to keep it no matter what, what he wanted me to do, what his, what, what he really asked me to do was to stop feeling something and I didn't know how to stop the feeling. So I was trying to talk about how to stop the actions, how to how I could curtail my behavior. And he was heartbroken. And I actually have a lot of compassion for him. I we didn't there was no we didn't know how to talk about this. I, I'm not saying that he was wrong for asking me to do this, but I wanted to have this more nuanced conversation. Like, hey, things are shifting on my internal landscape. I'm having all of these feelings and I don't know how to stay accountable to that vow that I kept. Yeah. At that, that, that time, vow that I made. Did, did you feel out of accountability or were you investigating it? Right. The reason I, I, so accountability has always been a big deal for me. And the thing I did that I thought kept me accountable was the very first thing I did was not kiss you, was not tell you, was not, and I told him first. I felt like my first obligation was to him. Um, and so I thought from there we would figure out what the dynamic shift would be. And that's how you and I do our relationship now. We often will make promises and then change our minds. Yep. Um, yep. Well, I, 
another way or another place this came up was um, I was running the gym we owned together. I was lead trainer and um, lead marketing. I was all of that. I was I was out yeah. in the front of everything, um, and I had all client facing responsibilities. And af- about a month after we got married, and you were diagnosed with MS, I was overwhelmed and wanted out. And so I said so. I said I'm overwhelmed and I want out. And you were. You were great about moving into a space of, oh, we have to renegotiate. Yeah. And that was incredibly helpful for me. What did it feel like? Because that's what I feel like it couldn't happen. There was the accountability was to a promise I had made, honestly. So this vow that I had taken, I was 20 when I got married. I was 17 when I got engaged, 20 when I got married. And fast forward, it was, I was 33 when I was being told you made a vow, you made a promise, you have no choice. Stop having that feeling. So I had changed. Yeah. So how did you handle it? I had also made a promise to you. You had invested a hundred thousand dollars or more in the business we owned together. Um, and I changed the rules. Like I, I, and what I did, I, I, I couldn't imagine continuing what I was doing. And I said, I can't do this. And that was gonna, that left you holding the bag. So how I felt about this. So when I um, was, I was raised as a boy, little boy, got boy stuff, got lots of stories about knights and honor and and vows and stuff like that. And honestly, I never really got them. I, I could see that there were people who feel vows as like a, a, a like an immovable object. Mm-hmm. Um, and I never felt that that mm-hmm. way. I felt like, I, I always felt like life should be a conversation and that we make commitments. But but promises are a questionable concept for me. Like, I promise. Which, a, like, just what, let what me tell the, you, that makes me itch a little bit. <laughs> promises are question <laughs> questionable concept for you. It's just, but, but these are but, like... But commitments The semantics are, of it. The semantics right? of it, yeah. I like the idea of promises, mm-hmm. despite the fact that I will go back on them and want to renegotiate them. So, yeah. And you is. have a less, like, tight grasp on the idea mm-hmm. of them even. And, and part of it is, well, a tight grasp, I don't, I don't make a lot of promises. They make me itch because I know there are too many ways that I could find myself unable to keep the promise. And because I read all those stories and everything, promises are supposed to be unbreakable. Oh. So I'm, I'm, it's a perfectionist thing, I suppose. Um, but oh, so that's I'm, really interesting. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hesitant to commit myself to something that I can think of ways without, before I've even said the sentence, that I could find myself unable to hold that up. And I don't want to do that. But I would like to commit to doing something and then have a conversation about how it's going to work and what might need to change. So that's super important. Um, I was seeing someone for a while last year and she added a, an absolutely essential piece to my understanding of how agreements are made. Um, she told me that um, in making agreements, and she was talking about in the concept of co-parenting with people who you're not living with, she found that the most important part was having a, a, an agreement that could adjust when things inevitably changed that that was the thing that helped people stay safe and stay in relationship to each other and wow i love like yeah i pretty much fell for that person right in that moment i was like that is that makes sense to me and it made me feel safe with her because a promise that i'm asked to keep oh my gosh yeah I, actually i feel like i'm gonna i'm, <laughs> I'm gonna cry being asked to keep the promise that was going to have me have to deny my feelings, smush them down, not even talk about them and pretend like they don't exist. The reason I didn't keep that promise was because I thought I might act I I thought it might kill me to try to swallow that and just hold it down. Um I didn't need to act on it necessarily, but I was afraid I would go insane. Um, and there's a history of mental illness in my family and it like that woke up every, every fear pattern I had that if I had to deny that piece of myself that I couldn't bear it. And so the, 
the other option, the, the option that I often say I threw my whole life into the wood chipper, wouldn't recommend it. That's why I help people walk out of monogamy and into polyamory with skills and a lot of negotiation and grace is because it's a shift in paradigm that can destroy a lot. You, you always, um, you always let me be the dynamic individual that I am. You have, you have always shown me this great amount of grace with, oh, did you change your mind? Okay, let's have a conversation about that. You ne don't necessarily use those words. No, I but, don't, but that is, that is what it but is. But you do. Yeah. And I'm really dynamic and a little, I mean, a little hot headed, a little big witchy energy. So I can sometimes move really quickly into like a new idea and yep. um, you have a, a grounded ca capacity to be like, well, okay, let's, let's talk that out. But what does it feel like for you when I hold you accountable? Because I think I'm a little rigid here. Okay. Um, that's a, a new thought. Um, I don't think it's really a new thought. I think you've thought I was rigid before. <laughs> So like I a think Viagra it, level rigid I, at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, I'm really, uh, my mind is whirling with that, uh, that definition of accountability you, you gave me, uh, you just gave us um, about understanding, about comprehension. So I haven't found you rigid the way you're thinking because I don't feel it that way, that, because I don't feel promises and commitments in mm. this way. I don't feel like you're being rigid. I feel like you're being um, very clear in your communication about your understanding of the situation. So that's not rigid. That's actually a, a gift. And even though there's part of me who is feeling bad about not having about having let you down is one of the ways that I feel. It's like I, I did offer to do something mm. and and I didn't do it. And you relied on me because that's another thing because you... Um, you were you were counting on me to do it reliability definitely matters and i didn't do it and so i have i have put you into a place of maybe uh feeling unsafe or unsupported or or uh, just that you can't do something you had committed to doing i interfered with all of that i i have feelings of inadequacy and, mm. and sadness and as a youngest brother it just spirals <laughs> real fast um Although I've learned a lot about how to handle that. Uh, so, but what I feel in those moments when you change your mind, mm -hmm. it's not, an, I hear you describing maybe it feels asymmetric. It doesn't. Because when I let you down, I feel a whole bunch of things about myself. And what I want to do is talk with you about what happened, how it got that way. And, you know, a lot of times you don't because you're like, but I have mm. to deal with this this the ramifications of you not having done this and that's what i want to work on right now and we'll work on understanding you later and then we do oh so okay so let's divide out there's at least a couple things going on when we're talking about accountability then there's the the practical uh material things that can, mm -hmm. can't happen don't happen or can't no. happen because someone let you down someone did not follow through and then there's the relational part where I might actually be proud of you for letting me down if it was for a good reason. Right. So we can give a really extreme example, but um, we were <laughs> a really extreme example. What's this one? I'm curious. When my mother was dying, I was all oh, alone. Oh, that is an extreme I had example. not driven my car out to the hospital. I needed to make the decision yeah. about whether to withdraw life support or not. And I made the decision and then everyone left. And I didn't have a car with me because I'd ri driven out with people. There were six or seven people there, um, including you and everybody left and you, um, you left as well because your partner wanted you to come back and it was Easter and wanted you to go yeah. to an outing. And, um, it meant that I was alone. And then when my mother died, um, and I, to be clear, like I walked my mother through that process as best I could. I'm not I'm sad sometimes about having been alone, and also I'm glad that I, who had, had prepared myself to be with death, was the one who was there with her, and I didn't take anything away from her. I stayed with it. So, while it's tender, 
it was a good example because when she passed, I called you and I said, it's, I'm here and now I'm alone and I have nowhere to go. And I was two and a half hours away from home. And, um, and so you needed to decide to leave something mm -hmm. that you had promised to be at. You were at an yeah. event with your kids and your wife and you had to decide what to do. I think most people hearing that story would say, well, so you go pick up your friend because somebody's like, because you're not going to leave her stranded at the hospital, right? right? Right. But in that moment, um, you had to make that decision and you weren't understood. You weren't yeah. understood by the person <laughs> who you were not. letting down. Yep. You got a lot of pushback and there was no conversation about like why this was okay, uh, you know, why it needed to be okay. That's an extreme example, but there are going to be things that require us to go back on our plans and our yeah. words. Yeah. And some of those things are going to feel like, so I fell in love with another person and a lot of people would say, well, screw you. You don't get to do that. Keep your vow. Um, and I would say, well, my, my soul is having a sp an experience and I get to decide what to do with that. I didn't have to take the path I did, but I don't think I, I don't think I would actually respect myself if I had just stuffed it down and not mm. like not asked for what I wanted, which was to process and work through this and figure out what was on the other side of it and whether it was just some sort of crush or what, or what it meant even. So I don't care how obvious it is, whether it's obvious to the degree like, should we pick up our friend from the hospital when you our mother can't has get passed? Home any other way? Or whether it's complicated, like it was in the situation with um, when I fell in love with you. Dynamic, the capacity to be with the, the complexity, the dynamic nature of life, and let other people impact you. Can you let yeah. your partner? Can you let your friends? Can you let your intimate connections, can you let them impact you and not lose your sense of like, okay, I'm still okay. Um, resilience. So when, when, when it was pointed out to me that an agreement was only as strong as its resilience, and that's the way I put it um, when Hannah told me that it would be, it was, uh, it was how, how you'd come back together, how you would figure out mm -hmm. what the next step was when an agreement. An agreement is only as strong as the resilient plans and capacities it has. Like a bridge, right? A bridge is only as strong as its resilient factors. That's right. That's, that's what I it's want. Gotta be able out of to my... respond and flex and. So I don't want strict accountability anymore. And that actually is shocking that must me. must feel weird for you. Yeah, I feel like I'm just now in quite a worried way <laughs> realizing that i may in fact have made a mistake um i yeah yeah well um, not a mistake but like i feel like this is a bit of an identity crisis because i have thought of myself as such an accountability fiend well i think what's really interesting about <laughs> this is i have been watching you for years and what you're describing is 100 percent in alignment with who you are and how you act and with your stated values. Mm -hmm. and But on top of that is this, this definition of accountability that you've had. It's not you that's changing. It's your definition of what accountability is and what it can look like. Right. And so some part of me really did adhere, like wanted to adhere to that strict definition and almost militaristic definition of accountability. Simple. And I didn't write that. No. That's right. Um, that's not your. That's a that's a rule thing. that was written into my first marriage, mm. ah. and it was written in. I even remember some early conversations that made that true. He was a much more static person than I am, or that than you are, and and to each their own. He likes things to be extremely stable and level and the same. So sure, uh, and I had grown up in such chaos that that was very comforting at first. Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. For, Time to, to update point. my own, like my own self concept with, with this reality. Um, I'd like to follow up and do some more work on this around relationship agreements and what it means to have a relationship agreement that is 
resilient because I, I work on these with, with couples who are transitioning from monogamy to some form of open relating all the time. In fact, I offer, I offer VIP days where people do this or VIP weeks sometimes where we work on it over a period of a few days. Um, and we always work on resiliency strategies, but I don't think I've ever been able to say it as crisply and cleanly as your relationship agreement will only be as strong as the resiliency factors that you build into it. Just like your accountability <laughs> in the other direction will only be as strong as the understood explicable consequences of your actions yeah. will be, right? So I, we need to take all of that into account. I just had this, this mental picture um, paint itself for me of, okay, so if we're going to have accountability between us, um, it can be like this rigid rod that yep. holds us in place yep. at a distance from each other, or it can be something that flexes as things change sure. that allows us to, to, to sometimes Contract get closer, sometimes get further away, depending on what's going on. And, and that rigid bar designed to hold us in place we can't hold in place. So no matter how standard is, we want to be, we're not. So what you're saying is a a um, a flexibly rigid silicon si like we all cylinder see where this is going, right, folks? between <laughs> us would be better. <laughs> I think that would be better, right? It would allow for an amount of flexibility and contraction and expansion. And yes, okay, that's I do think yeah. I'm so. hearing that. I'm hearing that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're gonna go instead of an enjoy. We're gonna go with a nice fun factory silicone job. Right. The enjoy is very rigid. Very rigid. Okay. If you're not, if you didn't get that, you'll want to listen to the sex toys episode with Beth Hanks, because um, there's a lot of fun to be had with rods held between you. Yeah. It was a great metaphor. It was well Sorry done. Sorry if I ruined I, I it with my joke. It. No, no. It's it was a great uh, <laughs> extension of the metaphor. Thank you. Okay, this was, I think, let's call it. Let's call I want to pick like this it. up and talk about accountability There's and relationship said, agreements but... again. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been awesome. Gotta... And thank you for coming on this windy listen with us people. Yeah, we're going to do a little noise control. We'll and I think do, it'll be but... okay. I think it's going to be okay. So if you were listening to all this and you're thinking, damn, relationships are messy. <laughs> Remember that I always say, that's good news. Don't worry. And keep talking to each other. There's no one right way to design your relationship. And lots of people, actually about 25%, according to a recent national survey, are interested in some type of open relationship. But how do you know if you are ready to open up happily? Not everyone is, and that's no problem. I've got a 60 second quiz that will give you the answer. And even better, You'll walk away with your next step, whether you're good to go or not so much when it comes to opening up. And this is no BuzzFeed nonsense. I personally designed this quiz from my years of academic research. Go to joliquiz.com. That's J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z.com and find out if you're ready to open up happily and what to do if you are or if you're not. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J O L I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable sex, love, losses, and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. <laughs> she managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs> <laughs>